Welcome back to DM Gives Inspiration, where today we're going to continue our topic about teaching our players how to play by teaching you how to play. So today's topic is all about player weapons and what all these categories, weapon types, damage types mean mechanically for your table and how you then translate them into the imagination, the fun part of the game. Now in a world with perfect players, they should show up with items equipped that they can actually wield and items that are effective enough that you don't have to balance your game around their mistakes. But we often don't have perfect players, or the player's imaginations escape the bounds of 5th edition and what it tries to make in a balanced combat setting. Let's loop back around to that in a moment, because from the DM perspective, weapon properties rarely come into play. When you select a knight, for instance, out of the monster manual, it comes with a greatsword and a heavy crossbow. You didn't need to know anything about those weapons because they're already guaranteed to be effective on the monster as they were already pre-selected for that monster. But if you wanted to get into home ruling, well then you might need to reflect what the players have to go through in order to make sure your knight is up to code. Thanks to tools like D&D Beyond, players often show up for their first session with weapons they can actually use. Understanding weapon properties as a DM is more important when it comes to loot. You need to know what sort of weapons your players can use, so you can give them weapons they can use. Or you can seduce them in the right direction to something a bit more effective, maybe higher damage for the type of class they're playing. I find the player's handbook rather unhelpful when it comes to teaching weapon types. The first thing it wants to dive into is melee or ranged weapons, which is rather self-explanatory. After all, you could just copy what your players are already using. Your rangers using a bow? Give them a plus one bow. Your clerics using a mace? Give them a plus one mace. What you actually want to be looking for here when it comes to weapons is simple, or martial weapons. And those two categories divide the weapons drastically into two different types. For instance, a warlock can only use simple weapons, but a barbarian can use simple and martial weapons. If you would like to see this information for yourself on your own character's sheets, all you have to do is look at the weapons category in the bottom left box. It's below armor, above tools, and languages. Having a weapon type listed here or having an individual weapon listed here means you possess proficiency, which means the player adds their proficiency bonus. So for instance, our warlock has access to all simple weapons, which the player's handbook lists as weapons often found in the hands of commoners. Clubs, daggers, hand axes, javelins, maces, quarterstaffs, sickles, and spears. They could also wield a light crossbow, darts, short bow, or a sling. Rudimentary weaponry for smacking, farm equipment, or perhaps the tools of a hobbyist or hunter. Now, of course, the martial ranged weapons are more robust, suggesting that you require some sort of training to use them effectively. A great example of this would be a flail, a ball on a chain. Likely, a warlock wouldn't know how to swing that round. A whip is also in this category. Take some training to use. For the most part, these are going to be your higher damage weapons. D8s through D12s and 2D6s. The highest damage you can hope to achieve with a simple weapon is a 1D8 on the Great Club. These martial weapons are things like battle axes, great swords, halberds, morning stars, pikes, scimitars, short swords, tridents and war picks. Warhammers, long swords. The ranged weapons can be things like a blowgun, a hand crossbow, a heavy crossbow, a longbow, or even a net. And if you've ever tried to throw a net, you know that it's surprisingly difficult to use. For the most part, weapon proficiencies, simple, martial, will be decided by the player's class. In the player's handbook, this is found in the class features section usually following the big table of all their various level-up stuffs. In the case of a cleric, it says proficiencies, weapons, simple. However, clerics might unlock additional proficiencies 
based on their domain choice. This makes perfect sense for a war domain cleric. Naturally, a warrior priest is trained in martial weapons. Martial weapons are also attached to the Death Domain, the Tempest Domain, and the Twilight Domain. But this can get quite messy. Rogues, for instance, get simple weapons, but also select weapons from the martial proficiencies. Longsword, Rapier, Short Sword. A note for the character sheet here, these are all divided by commas. So when it says longsword, comma, crossbow, comma, hand, what it actually means is longsword and crossbow of the hand crossbow type. Not that rogues are proficient with their hands. Everybody can make an unarmed strike. Some are better than others. This is where we have to assume that some sort of balancing on the rogue has taken place. They did not want a rogue getting access to all martial weapons. A battle axe wielding rogue is not allowed at level 1. Sometimes these things have nothing to do with balance at all. It's just merely a flavor choice, like what we see on the druid. Druids do not gain access to simple weapons. They instead list weapons. Club, dagger, dart, javelin, mace, quarterstaff, scimitar, sickle, sling, and spear. Now this one has a bit of history to it. Back in 1st edition, druids were a subclass of clerics. And clerics could never use edge weaponry. No swords allowed. But in order to distinguish a druid from its clerical roots, they allowed them to use crescent-shaped swords. Or in particular a mistletoe-harvesting sickle. The only other crescent-shaped sword that anybody knew the name of was a scimitar. So come 3rd edition, it was established that druids can use scimitars. That lives on now in the form of a big pile of weapons, most of which are not edged, except for those in the shape of a moon. But there may be other ways your players have mysteriously unlocked certain weapon types, such as their race. For example, the Eladrin, the High Elf, and the Wood Elf all give elf weapon training, which allows them to use long swords, short swords, short bow, and long bow. So if you have a elvish warlock, you now know where that bow came from. And as an elf, they'd also have the dex to use it. As your players level, other abilities may unlock proficiencies, in particular, feats. There's a good chance if your player avoids a stat increase in favor of a proficiency feat that they'll let you know about it. After all, it's a pretty big choice and a pretty big deny of those base stats. Let's skip ahead a little bit here and talk about the cool kids club of two-weapon fighting. Chances are someone at your table is going to want to dual wield. And you need to be the source of those rules. Dual wielding, two weapon fighting, is very easy. If you are using a light weapon in your main hand, you can use your bonus action to attack with your off hand if it is also a light weapon. The normal main hand weapon attacks normally, the bonus action off hand does not get the ability modifier added to it for the damage. So, main hand, dagger, 1d4 plus 4. Off hand, 1d4. If the weapon can be thrown, you may throw it instead, as that bonus action. Light weapons. Thrown weapons. A weapon attack with dexterity bonus. Where did all this come from? This is where weapon properties get important. And 90% of the time when the DM has to get involved in weapon properties, it's because someone's trying to use two-weapon fighting, dual wielding. So let's break down that dagger example. When you look at a weapon table, you see the weapon's name, the cost, the damage, the weight, and then properties. These are keywords that describe how the weapon works mechanically. All weapons baseline, in their original form, out of the box, are strength weapons. It takes strength to swing an axe. It takes strength to hit with a mace. It takes strength to 
cleave with a great sword. But when you see dagger, finesse, that finesse property, that keyword, is really important. Because it means, quote from the player's handbook, when making an attack with a finesse weapon, you use your choice of your strength or dexterity modifier for the attack and damage rolls. You must use the same modifier for both rolls. So a dexterity-based hero is likely to use weapons that have the finesse trait. Daggers, darts, short swords, scimitars. These would all be great gifts for a player who's in melee and has chosen to max out dex as their primary attribute. Returning to the dagger, it next says light after finesse. A light weapon. You'll note that all weapons are not light or heavy. There is an unlabeled neutral ground. A light weapon, quote from the player's handbook, is small and easy to handle, making it ideal to use when fighting with two weapons. That's it. If it's labeled as light, it can be used in the two-weapon fighting. Heavy is found on something like the Great Sword. Creatures that are small or tiny have disadvantage on attack rolls with heavy weapons. A heavy weapon's size and bulk makes it too large for a smaller, tiny creature to use effectively. Just kind of doubling down on that fact. Our dagger here also mentions Throne Range 20 slash 60. These numbers relate to its range. The first number indicates how far it can be thrown in this case, or fired in terms of feet, 20 feet. The second number indicates the long range. When attacking beyond the normal range, so 20 feet to 60 feet, a 40 foot range there, you have disadvantage on those attack rolls. This is where things get a little rules lawyery, but hold with it. Throne is a classifier of range. You're moving range to the power of throne. Throne means it embodies the aspects of the weapon when it is used as a ranged attack. So a javelin is a strength-based weapon to stab somebody with while it's in your hand. The reason it says throne range 30 to 120 means that when you throw it, you're still making a strength-based attack. Because otherwise, rules as written, it would have to be dexterity, a ranged attack. So here on our dagger, we have finesse, which means it can be used with strength or dexterity. It's light so it can be dual-wielded or two-weaponed, and it can be thrown. Thrown with finesse means it could be thrown using strength or dexterity. There are a couple of these that you might have to remind your players that they exist from time to time, such as two-handed. If a player wants to use a halbert, it requires two hands. That means they cannot use a shield. If they have a shield equipped in D&D Beyond, it'll not unequipped because they have a halberd equipped at the same time. So make sure their AC matches them holding a two-handed weapon. It might also be nice to remind that halberd player that they have reach, which means their melee weapon actually has a range of 10 feet, the box beyond the box next to their character on a battle grid. And if your player wants to attack with a quarterstaff, you might ask how many hands they're using. A versatile weapon like a quarterstaff allows the player to choose if they'd like to put away that shield for more damage. Swing a quarterstaff normally, 1d6. But should you use two hands and put that shield away, you get to use a 1d8. That's the versatile keyword. Things get pretty self-explanatory from there and your players should be able to handle it. If it says ammunition, like what's on a longbow, you need arrows and you're gonna minus your arrows as you fire arrows. If it says it needs loading, like a crossbow, it means you can't make two attacks with it per round. If, for instance, you're a fighter and you get two attacks for every attack action. All these proficiencies and properties work together to make players not really want to change items often. What usually happens is they find the biggest dice they can possibly wield with the best chance to hit and stick to it. 5th edition is not very friendly when it comes to improvised combat. 
your player might have an idea in their head that's very Jackie Chan or John Wick. They're going to use bottles, skis, sticks, and tables as weapons, their surroundings. According to the 5th edition rules, this is an improvised weapon and only gets a 1d4 for its damage roll. Now you can house rule that a table swung by a barbarian is a great club and give that player a d8. That'd be very nice and a great way to promote that creativity. Also note that improvised weapons do not get any proficiency bonus, so players are likely to miss. And even if they invest a full feat in being an improvised weapon master, they only get half proficiency, and that d4 becomes a d6. Once magic items, particularly those with pluses to hit and get involved, rarely will a player ever get creative with the type of weapon they're using. So take advantage of that chaos in the low levels, and have yourself an improvised combat. This episode is coming to a close, but you may have noticed we're missing a huge piece of these weapon tables. The damage type. Next episode, we'll get into damage types, resistances, and immunities. Something a little more on the DM side of things, but required this precursor to understand. I hope you found this useful. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to support this show, you can do so at patreon.com slash Kyle Ferguson, two S's in Ferguson. Music was by Brian Griffith. And I'll see you all next week with Season 9, Episode 3 of DM Gives Inspiration. Inspiration.